Welcome to Get Funded, Grant Writing Success. My name is Susan Dernan, and I'm the Administration Lead of the Mississauga Arts Council. This webinar is part of our TD Culture Lab Professional Development Webinar Series, presented by Mississauga Arts Council and sponsored by TD Bank Group. The Mississauga Arts Council is dedicated to enabling the growth of the arts by creating opportunity and connection between artists and residents in Mississauga and beyond. Now in our 42nd year, the Mississauga Arts Council is a registered charity dedicated to our vision of Mississauga as a vibrant cultural community where arts and culture thrive. The Mississauga Arts Council acknowledges that the land on which we gather is part of the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat and Wyandotte Nations. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land and give our respect to these peoples and their ancestors who have been inhabitants and caretakers of this land since time immemorial. We also recognize that Mississauga is now home to many global Indigenous peoples. Great. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Rohit Mehta, founder of Do Good Fundraising. A University of Toronto graduate, Rohit has been active in the nonprofit sector for 16 years. His experience working in fundraising roles with several nonprofit and charities and over a decade volunteering as a board member and leader within the sector led him to start Do Good Fundraising. The business helps nonprofits, charities, and artists to raise funds through grant writing, funder research, and professional development training. Learn more at dogoodfundraising.ca. Let's pass it over to you, Rohit. Thanks so much, Susan, and good evening, everyone. So I want to thank the Mississauga Arts Council for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, to all the artists on the call today. Um, and for those of you joining us from, looks like, across North America, uh, thanks so much for taking time. It really does pay to be a member of MAC, and I think over the years, as we've done more and more work with MAC, I've been introduced to a lot of great people and a lot of opportunities. Um, so if you haven't taken the time to become a member, this is... Uh, uh, me saying, just genuinely saying, definitely become a member. Uh, take a look at the opportunities that Mac provides artists and the platform. You know, we're a small business and we're getting a huge platform by, by being able to share some knowledge with you. And so I I do encourage everyone on this call to, to make sure that you see Mac as a resource that's going to help you grow your professional career. So I'm just going to get into it here um, and I'll skip this bio. Um, we write grants, we find grants, we train people on grants. Uh, we have a membership program that we offer to organizations uh, that are doing um, work on the front lines. And so I just wanted to share that. And now in today's presentation, we're gonna start by talking about common grant writing mistakes. So the way I approach tips to grant writing is I share what I've observed as a grant review team member, that on the grant review team of the Ontario Trillium Foundation for Peel and Halton. I did that for about five years. And so as a funder, you end up seeing a lot of the common things that people do wrong. Um, and so I'll use that to sort of share what you shouldn't do and what you should do uh, on grants. We'll talk about some arts uh, grants opportunities. So I've, I've gone through uh, a number of websites and really figured out what would be the best fit for Miss Saga Arts Council members. So we'll talk about that. And then at the end, we can have a discussion. Uh, feel free to ask some questions. Um, we're actually keeping an eye on the chat. So Susan is, is going to be typing in any questions that you have um, as I go along. So if you do have a burning question, type it in and I can pause and, and try and address it. Uh, if you're thinking it, other folks are probably also thinking it as well. So keep that in mind. Okay, so we'll get into it with 10 common grant writing mistakes. Um, and thank you to everyone who's taking time in the chat to introduce yourself and where you're from. So the 10 most common grant writing mistakes that are made. Mistake number 10, uh, no statistics or data. Okay, so as artists, we have to make sure that we tell our story. Uh, when you apply for a grant, many of the folks who are reviewing these grants, they've never heard of uh, your professional practice. They don't know all the good work that you've done. Um, they don't know the maybe the results that you've had in the past. So you need to start by talking about things like the number of albums you've sold if you're a musician, the number of exhibitions you've had if you're a visual artist, um, maybe the number of productions you've put on, let's say you're in film or media arts. And you want to make sure that you have data or stats which truly shows that there's a demand or an interest for your art. 
So we have a lot of mediums represented on uh, today's call. And I think, I think that regardless of your artistic practice or regardless of the work you do, you need to convince the funder that, that your work is significant, that it's, it's, it's broadly disseminated, and that you have an audience that's taking an interest in it. They'll be way more likely to support you if your stats and your data shows the impact rather than you speaking from your heart about how passionate you are for the work. Um, statistics and data help. Top 10 most common mistakes, number nine, is submitting late grant applications. We have done quite a bit of work with artists, and I noticed that many times, uh, for whatever reason, a lot more of the work tends to happen closer to the deadline. So this is definitely an issue um, because you don't get the best quality work close to the deadlines. You also have all the technical glitches that happen, you know, systems crash, uh, portals don't work, logins don't work. And so the advice here is to not just apply for grants in advance, but to make sure that you actually finish the process and, and have a final product days before the grant. There's a few reasons. Uh, number one, you can get your grant reviewed. So some of you have mentors, some of you are working with uh, the Arts Council, with, with other artists. Um, there are opportunities for you to have your grant reviewed in that sense. We also do grant reviews that do good fundraising. And um, I just think that a, a large project that you've invested so much time and energy into, if you have it done early, you can have um, even the, the program manager from the funder side be available to answer questions um, you can you can you know fine fine tune your application, wordsmith it. So there's a few reasons why you want to fill them out as early as possible. The other thing is you want to save a copy before you press submit. So what you want to do is every time you apply for a grant, you want to download that information, put it somewhere, put it in a Google Drive, Apple Storage, Amazon Storage, um, and and save that copy so that next time you're working on a grant, you have that information. But also because when you, when you win the grant, hopefully you win, you want to remember what you actually applied for, right? Um, and down the road, you're going to write a report on that grant. Maybe it's a one-page report, maybe it's a few paragraphs, but you need to go back and check what you promised so that you can tell the funder you achieved what you promised. And when in doubt, you should actually reach out to the funder. So there are groups like Do Good Fundraising who are available as a resource. Mac is available as a resource. In addition, the funders often have somebody who's actually appointed um, to support you on the grant application. It's their job. Uh, so don't ever feel shy about reaching out to them. If you have a question, you may be a bit nervous if it's the day before the deadline. And, and so for that reason, um, reach out early. Top 10 most common mistakes, number eight, not utilizing attachments. This is particularly important for the arts because our work uh, often moves people when they see the work, right? So, so your work needs to be seen, it needs to be heard, it needs to be experienced. When you're putting on um, exhibitions or performances or uh, you've created works, take good quality photos of them, right? If you're putting on something relatively large, hire a photographer. There's photographers within our network uh, at the Mississauga Arts Council that can, that, you know, you can be referred to. It's so important that you take the time to document this work because it's one thing to write a grant using text. It's another thing to then actually have attachments which the funder can then look at and say, oh wow, look at the quality of their production. Look at uh, the quality um, you know, of, of the performance that they put on or, or uh, you know, if it's media art, it really needs to be seen and experienced sometimes. Um, even sculpture can uh, add a lot to your grant application if there's an image of something that you've created in the past. Um, in other grants, we've actually added things like testimonials, newspaper clippings, um, even recognition, you know, recognition from a prominent uh, politician or community member for the work you've done. Some grants are now getting into this uh, new sort of way of operating where you can actually record a video of you speaking, and you could submit that as part of the grant application. Um, others ask you for a video attachment or an audio attachment. So this is becoming more and more important. And I, I just think that if you come up with attachments and they're high quality, 
if a grant uh, opportunity gives you the chance to add those, you may uh, have a much stronger chance of success than those applicants who didn't add an attachment, right? So there's a question about if an artist doesn't have a lot of experience, what sort of data um, can they share in order to make their application stronger? Um, let's say for instance, it's a production company that's putting on a second production. I think you need to remember that we're in a social media age, right? So, so before funders did not care about your website and they never used to go on social media. Now it is almost a requirement. We submitted a grant for nonprofit organizations uh, last week and every single applicant had to write in not just your social media handles, but specifically what's your Facebook, what's your Instagram, and then what's your website. And, and a lot of artists are using TikTok these days. So make sure that if you're doing good work as an artist, make sure that's being seen because there's actually value to that. That's sort of like a, a I would say an addendum to your application. It's, it's additional aspects of your grant application that you'd be surprised. Funders will look at it and um, we're going to get to a point where all arts uh, applications are going to have a section for an Instagram link or a TikTok link. Um, so if I can give you a tip, it's that you should really be documenting your work, no matter what kind of artist you are. Um, and that way, you know, you can make your application stronger. If you need data and statistics, well, you want to look at how many people engaged and interacted with it. If it's online, how many views were there? Um, if your 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 work was promoted through social media, what were those numbers? What were the what were the number of uh, interactions? You can see that if you if you have a Twitter account or a Facebook page, they show you the um, the the interactions. If you go on the back end and look at the statistics, um, websites websites can have Google Analytics uh, on them, which would allow you to see how many people are visiting and interacting with that site. So there's a lot you can do that goes beyond the text of the grant. Out. Okay. Let's keep going here. Top 10 most common mistakes. For those of you who are joining us, we're going through most common mistakes in grant writing uh, from an artist's perspective. So number seven is underselling your work. And that means that you may not think your presentation or your exhibition was noteworthy, so you leave it out. Well, I think it's important to show a, a history or a track record of successes. I was working on a music grant uh, and, and it specifically said, tell us about the number of albums sold, how much revenue you generated. You know, there was another question that said, tell us about similar projects you've put on, give detail. And so in that case, you want to not just talk about your sales, but when you put on similar projects, maybe you're asking for money to put on an album uh, and you've done a similar album in the past, you managed it yourself, even if it was your own money, someone else's money, you want to put those numbers in there. You want to brag a little bit um, to show you have a track record. You can be trusted. Um, don't worry about, you know, if you only had uh, a few thousand dollars in sales or if you only had a, a few dozen people interact with your, um, you know, whatever work of art that you produced, it's sort of the time to brag about your accomplishments. And if you don't do this, you have to get better at this as an artist. You have to really sell yourself because you're competing against a ton of folks who, who are good at that. And um, if you can sell yourself as an artist and really show that people, I say it again, people are interacting with your work, they're engaging with it, they're clicking it, they're liking it, they're, they're following it, um, you're going to be more likely to win a grant, right? So there's, there's a, a broad question about what percentage of applications get accepted or rejected. Uh, one of the funders that I was involved in, they used to say that for every, uh, I guess for every dollar requested, only 25 cents is granted, which means 25% of those applications would get approved. Um, when I speak to OAC staff, they often say, it's, it's pretty common for your first application to get rejected. Uh, I don't love that, but I guess what they're saying is you go through the process, you go through their uh, rigorous grant application, you fill out all the answers, you add all the attachments, and all of a sudden, um, you know, you apply. Now you've gone through that exhausting process, and even if you get rejected, at least you know the process, right? At least you know all the questions that are going to be asked and the intense number of attachments. And so next time you apply, it's going to be easier. 
And maybe the first time you were just trying to fill out every box and every attachment, but the next time, uh, chances are that you'll, you'll already have some of the content done and you can focus on quality answers. Um, yes, yeah, so I hope that helps. Let's keep going here and talk about uh, top 10 most common mistake number six, which is not expressing urgency. There is a, a, an organization I was working with just last week and um, they have a project that uh, they, they got some funding for. So they got some money to put up a, a statue, something pretty prominent. But what they weren't able to explain, even in our, our interactions, was that the money that was received was actually time-based, okay? That money had to be spent on that project. It wasn't until we got to the final stage that they said, oh yeah, by the way, if we don't spend the money by this date, we're gonna lose it. And I said to them, you really need to express that in this grant. The funder is gonna be way more likely to fund uh, this artistic project if they know that you have money in the pipeline and it's gonna be lost, right? Um, really any challenge that you're having as an artist, you can express urgency. I saw a, a grant uh, in, on the West Coast in BC and they specifically said, we will fund writers and we'll give um, X amount of money. I think it was up to $10,000 based on your circumstance. And if you've experienced significant hardship due to COVID, due to lockdown restrictions, that's an extra reason for them to fund you, right? And so I, I gave some examples here in the bullets of persuasive language. You know, this grant is essential because this funding will enable me to immediately, or without this grant, my artistic practice will you know, decline, or you know, I won't be able to continue as a professional artist. Um, so it's the idea of urgency. It helps funders to actually prioritize your work over other people. And uh, when you're sitting around the funding table, because I've, I've been there at those tables with other reviewers, and you're looking at two applications, the one that's more urgent, it, it, it's going to get more attention, right? If there's a project and the funder sees that you've already secured other funding for it, you know, the venue is booked, the, the tickets are, are, uh, are already, um, you know, being sold, for instance, and it's going ahead, they're more likely to fund it than something that may or may not happen in the future. There's no urgency. There's no, uh, you know, there's no guarantee. And I always tell folks that when you're working on a project, you should show that you have some skin in the game. You should show that you have some money in that project. Maybe it's 500 or $1,000 that you're putting in out of your pocket that you were planning to do anyway. You should put that into the project. You should put that in your budget. And it shows that, um, there's more people invested in the project. There's, there's already money in there. It's already moving, it's going. So I think that's super important. Top 10 most common mistakes, number five, is starting from scratch. You really have to see granting as something that is a continuous process that you're going to keep doing. You may be a professional artist for 15 or 20 years, and every year you should be applying for grants. You should even apply for the same grants. Even if you applied last year and you got rejected, you should um, try and obtain some feedback and apply again. And what holds people back isn't necessarily answering the questions because a lot of us can answer the questions. It's often this administrative stuff. What's your budget? Um, you know, what? Uh, tell us about uh, who you are as an artist and what motivates you. Um, you know, provide us with your bio. Provide us with your financial uh, financial statements for your you know professional artistic practice. Um, provide us with a list of work that you've produced with um, you know your your CV. These are all things that add time to the grant writing process, and it's what stops people from applying for grants because they say, well, you know, there's ten questions over here, but they asked me for a million attachments. I, I don't have time to gather all these. And the trick is you keep a folder where you put all these documents in one place. So you can put them in a Google Drive folder. Uh, you know, we'll use Dropbox sometimes, even on your, your own computer, you can have a folder, everything is there. And with strategic pitches, especially, if you've worked on a grant, you should take that information and start with it next time you're applying for a grant. You know, there was um, uh, some sort of a pitch competition um, and I remember I spent like a good hour wordsmithing some information about our own social enterprise business. And then later on, like two months later, uh, another similar uh, opportunity appeared. And I just copied and pasted that text and I, and I put it in there. 
um, because I had spent so much time working on it the first time. And so this is really about getting organized. If you have a folder and, and, and you have all this uh, information and all these materials in there, it shows how organized you are. And um, you'll find the process of grant writing to be easier and smoother once you do this. Um, you know. So top 10 most common mistakes, number four, is not committing to long-term projects. We see this a lot in in fundraising uh, we see this a lot um, where people who apply for grants they'll see an opportunity and they'll say okay i'm going to make up a project and i'm going to apply and let's hope i get it because i need i need the money or i need funding or i really want to do this work and so i have to get funded but a lot of times a funder will look at your budget just from a budget alone even i can tell if a project has been made up just for that grant right so so how do you do things differently? What you want to do is you want to come up with projects that are sticking to your artistic style. Uh, it's sticking to the way you um, practice as an artist. You know, maybe maybe yeah, you're exploring watercolor, or maybe uh, you're going in in a certain direction. You're gonna, uh, you know, as a musician, you're gonna explore African beats this year, and and you want to produce a new album. Okay. Regardless of what it is, if you stick to that and you say, okay, rather than randomly applying for every grant that shows up, I'm going to just find opportunities that give uh, visual artists a chance to put on an exhibition or that give me a chance to record an album, you know, put out a demo uh, to, to focus on collaboration, maybe to be mentored um, by a prominent uh, musician, you know, to help me improve my professional practice. If you focus on really specific projects and you allow the grants to fit into your project, you will be far more successful than artists who just apply for any grant they see, right? And I think there's some artists I've met over the years who have a long-term project. They're they're trying to work on a particular um, a particular thing, like let's say media arts, for instance. They're trying to you know put on a certain exhibition that that. Um, a, enables uh, a, a sort of mixed media to come together uh, into a certain platform. If a funder sees that consistently you're applying for the same sort of thing, uh, they're way more likely to fund you because they see that consistency. They see your name come up again and again, and they say, ah, this is a mixed media artist from Mississauga. You know, they've applied in the past. We know them, we saw their application. They made it, they made it to the final round and then they got declined. You know what? Uh, we should give them a chance this time, right? And and that's where I say funding is about a relationship. The organizations that are very successful, extremely successful with funding, as well as the artists who are extremely successful, they often know the program manager. They've been on the phone with that person. Um, you know, they've gone to their information sessions. They've they've built a relationship with them and they've engaged with them to the point where when your name shows up. They say, oh, yes, this artist is actually committed to doing this professional practice over the long term. We're going to invest in them. And you'll see a bit later on in my presentation, there are grant opportunities that are specifically for experienced artists. So even though it might seem like as a new or emerging artist, there's not enough opportunity, the longer you work on uh, fundraising and, and, and applying for grants and submitting these requests, the more experienced you become. And down the road, you are seen as an experienced artist. It's inevitable that the, the more time you spend doing this, you are likely to succeed. And, and you're probably likely to start winning every grant um, down the road as funders start to take note of who you are. Right? Top 10 most common mistakes on grant writing number three, spelling and grammar. We have so much uh, technology right now. You can go into a Google Doc and it will literally finish your sentences. Uh, Grammarly is amazing. I've, I've tried it before. I was blown away. Um, even, uh, you know, AI is, is, is emerging uh, right now. And, you know, it has its pros and cons. But one of the pros is that it can uh, improve your writing quite a bit. Um, you should never have mistakes in your, in your uh, proposals ever. There, there shouldn't be... Um, structural and grammar mistakes, I should say, because those are super easy to fix. My advice is if you're applying for a grant such as OAC or Factor, take a Google Doc, type up your answers there, and then copy and paste them into the portal. Don't do it the other way around where you write your answers in the portal. 
and then later on you think you're going to copy and paste because sometimes everything gets deleted. Um, over the years, I've had folks come up to me and tell me, you know, whether they're working with us or not, they have told me that certain portals caused all their stuff to delete or, you know, the, the, there's that forever loading circle that just never stops. Uh, I've seen that in, in the OAC portal before. Um, so consider authoring your proposals elsewhere where they have really good spelling and grammar checks and then bring them back. You don't want your grant to be declined because they didn't understand what you were saying, right? And, and, you know, there's tons of help available. You can reach out to Mac if you really, truly need help with proposal writing, and they'll find a way to support you. But I think, um, for the most part, good spelling and grammar, like a well-written answer, makes you way more likely to be successful. Um, and it's a basic expectation for a winning grant. It has to be written in great English, you know, or French. Top 10 most common mistakes. Number two, using too much jargon. Okay, so so we are all practicing in different areas of the arts, right? There's there's uh, more than thirty of us here, and I'm sure we're we're from different uh, artistic disciplines. You know the special language they use within your artistic practice. You know uh, the industry specific wording and the acronyms. You should avoid using all of those, unless the grant is very specifically for a certain, um, you know, specific type of. Uh, a percussion performance or a specific type of, uh, you know, painting style, which uses a specific brush, uh, brush stroke. Like it's very rare that, that artists will be super niche um, when it comes to applying for arts funding. If you have to be that detailed, go ahead. You'll see it in the guidelines. You'll see that they'll say, you know, we're only going to take Japanese style, you know, calligraphy, Okay, then then use your industry specific language if that's if that's what the grant is about. But for the most part, most grants are very broad, and the grant reviewers have no knowledge about which specific professional practice you may um, come from. And so you want to actually bring the complexity level down, right? When I was reviewing grants, I remember there were times where I saw an acronym and I thought, okay, I don't even know what that means. So I'm going through the grant, I'm going up to the top, I'm trying to look for the definition and you know, as a reviewer, we're reading the, the, the answers. And I was a provincial government reviewer, you know, and, and, and a lot of you will be applying to a provincial government grant or maybe a, a municipal grant in the future. When we're reviewing, you know, a lot of us are doing it uh, off the side of our desk or, you know, we're doing it on evenings and weekends. We don't have a ton of time to review, right? So if you keep your language simple, funders are going to get it. And if they get your work, uh, and then maybe they look at some of your attachments and they're inspired by your work, you're more likely to be successful, right? A tip is to have a friend or family member review it because often they won't know a lot about what you're doing. And if they have a ton of questions, chances are that it's probably not well written. But if they read it and they, you know, they genuinely took time to understand it and they don't have a lot of questions, chances are you explained yourself pretty well. And that's probably a good sign. Okay, so we've gone through nine common mistakes that are made in grant writing, and I'm going to tell you the top most common mistake. Um, I wonder if anyone can guess it in the chats. What do you think is the most common mistake people make on grant writing? What mistake do artists make most often, more than anything? Take a second. What do you think? What's the most common mistake that I haven't mentioned yet? They don't ask for a specific amount. That's an interesting one. M many grants, you have to ask for a specific amount, like there'll be a box. Um, not applying at all. That's a good one, yeah. Yeah, no attachments, that's true. Not meeting the deadline, right? So they've missed the deadline, okay. Ooh, applying for the wrong grant. So the most common mistake, yeah, is not answering the question, Susan. And, and the thing is, you know, as grant reviewers, we'll look at a grant and what we'll do is we'll very quickly skim, right? We'll I'll ask a question like, um, tell us about your past experience um, managing budgets for similar projects. And, you know, I've seen answers where people will go off on a tangent. They'll talk about, um, you know, they'll, they'll talk about broad things or they'll, they'll provide like statistics or vague information. If a question says, tell us about your most, uh, 
recent experience um, or tell us about your experience with managing budgets, your next answer, like the first sentence should say something like, I have five years of experience managing budgets, you know, as a, as a professional uh, visual artist, for example. I have three years of experience managing productions um, as a theater professional. I have uh, produced six albums, you know, um, and have self-managed and self-published, right? So, so exactly. So get to the point um, right then and there. And I think, I think the key is to answer the question right away and then give preamble, right? Or, or not preamble, but then provide a little bit of detail, then go into detail about how many albums did you produce specifically how much money um, or, or how many exhibitions did you manage? How much money did you manage? When did they take place? Where? And, you know, a lot of times I'll read, I'll read answers if I'm doing a review because we do grant reviews. And sometimes I'm reading the answer. And the most common thing that I, I keep writing is, well, you haven't answered the question here or, uh, you know, this information is irrelevant or this information is vague. This is what we see a lot. We see it again and again, where folks will include information, but when you read the information, it doesn't necessarily correspond to the question. It could be good information, but maybe it belongs elsewhere. So in our grant writing practice, what we do is when we see information that is useful in, in that Google Doc, we just gray it out, we don't delete it. And then later on, we see if we can put that somewhere else. Many grant applications actually have a section that says something like, uh, is there anything else you would like us to know? Do you have anything you would like to add? Is there anything that you would like to share with us uh, you know, that you didn't share in this application? Right? So they practically give you the chance to put that extra information somewhere. So you're way, uh, way more likely to um, be successful if you answer the question to the point, you know, short answers uh, within the word limits, of course, um, and if you avoid anything that's unnecessary or vague uh, or broad. So Susan, I'll just ask for a time check about how much time we have, and then we'll go on here to the next section. And um, I, I'm just trying to recall if we're going until 8 or 8.30. Um, so, so we'll talk about current arts grant opportunities now, and, I, and I've, I've gone through and kind of uh, uh, put together a number of opportunities for different, uh, different folks from different mediums. So generally, they have an online portal. And what I want to say is um, you need to register for this online portal, and you don't want to do it the day of the grant. I can almost assure you that something will go wrong if you try and register for a grant application the day before. And, and, and it'll just be stressful, right? Because we've been there so many times, people's passwords aren't working, the portal isn't working, or you're not getting the automated email. Sometimes folks can't even get into the email, right? You have a professional email that's uh, associated with your um, uh, you know, portal. And, and, and there's a point here that, that actually Canada Council for the Arts takes a month to approve new accounts, one month. That is really sad and it's quite bureaucratic, but I think the point is that if you want to apply for certain grants, you need to do it early. And so if you're, if you're planning to apply for a grant and you know, let's say it's Ontario Arts Council, let's say today's the 28th of February, and you know that you wanna apply for a grant that's due on April 1st, well, April sounds far away, but it's not far away at all. Uh, you need to go in now, create a portal, make sure you have all that information and, and start going through it. The other thing is I've seen so many artists do this thing where they think, okay, Toronto Arts Council. Yeah, I do work in Toronto. Sure, I'll apply. And they keep thinking to themselves, I'll apply, I'll apply. Well, it's not until you actually create a, a, a login that you realize that many of those Toronto grants require residency in Toronto. You have to live there. So mentally, you were working in the grant, you were, you know, at your apartment, you're in the shower, you're thinking about the grant the whole time. Oh, yeah, I can win. I'm going to win this. Whereas if you don't take time to register, you may not even know that sometimes you can't register. Canada Council is, is a particularly uh, challenging one because they can deny your grant application. You know, we work with arts organizations and, and, and many of the organizations we've worked with, when they first uh, filled out the online portal, it got declined. 
we still are in touch with organizations that are doing good work on the ground in the arts and they, they can't get their profile approved. And it's pretty hard to reach Canada Council. So you won't, you won't see me talking a lot about them in the next few slides. I haven't included a ton of info there, um, but OAC is, is one of the best ones. Ontario Arts Council is highly recommended. Um, they usually want an artist bio. You should not be making this up every time. You should have one standard bio. It should be on your website. It's probably on your Facebook page. That's the one you should include. And they want a CV, a curriculum vitae, which is just a resume, uh, essentially, with a history about, about your past work. Um, most arts grants will generally ask about, you know, what's the impact uh, on your professional career? What's the broader impact for society? So if you want to be ahead of the game, come up with these questions somewhere and keep them in a, in a Google Doc or a Word Doc so that when you're answering them, you can tweak them, right? And then, and then a lot of them want a budget with detailed expenses. And when I say detailed, you know, don't just say, um, oh, yeah, we're going to pay our collaborators $1,000, $2,000, right? They want hourly rates or daily rates or you know, uh, whatever duration you choose, but they even want to know how did you come up with those rates. So some of you may have heard of CARFAC, right? CARFAC is, is, is an industry standard. It's C-A-R-F-A-C. It's an industry standard that allows you to, um, to see what the recommended schedule is for fees, right? Let's say there's some folks collaborating with you. Or let's say you're just doing something on your own and you ask yourself, hmm, what should I pay myself? Should I pay myself minimum wage or more? Well, when you go through an industry standard, then you can come up with really solid rates uh, that, that would be broadly accepted. And you can also put that in your budget. So you can say, well, I'm going to be paid X amount of dollars per hour for five hours or more of you know putting on this exhibition or being part of this production, or, uh, et cetera. And then you actually write source CARFAC, you know, CARFAC dash R A A V, I think it's called. Um, and then, and then not a lot of funders want you to sign things these days because after COVID, most of that disappeared. But sometimes you have to sign something, you have to initial something, et cetera. Um, so keep that in mind when you're applying for grants. This is kind of the broad structure. Okay. Um, somebody's asked for detail on developing budgets. So I can talk about that. Uh, and then someone asked about how do you self promote? So when it comes to budgets, I, I don't have an example here. I wish I had thrown one in here. But when it comes to budgets, um, what you want to do is you want to put in some very specific information about how you calculated that expense. If I could give you one piece of advice, that box for description is extremely important. Um, if you can describe how you came up with that calculation, you are far more likely to be successful um, because uh, a lot of times your, your budget calculations are, are what the funder is looking at. Um, and maybe towards the end of this talk, I can actually pull one up. Uh, so I think, I think the math is important. It's important to show how you came up with that uh, math for your budget. And it's also important to show quantity and duration so for instance, if you're working on something uh, and, and it's, you know, you're, you're going to require a curator for five days, you need to show that you're going to pay them X amount of money per hour times X number of hours times five days, right? And, and then you want to reference how did you come up with their fee? Um, if you don't do this, if you just write $1,000, sometimes the funder is going to think you made it up. And sometimes they're going to think that perhaps the uh, amounts that are in here are rounded or they're not based on anything specific, they're just estimates, right? Um, so I think that's super important. And uh, I do have a budget in mind that I can bring up a little bit later on in the call. Um, so just stay tuned for that. And then the other one was about self-promotion. How, how can we promote? So the most important thing here um, when it comes to promoting your work is that you use high quality images, photos and other media and that you put it on social media. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of saying that we're at a time and place now where it's almost expected that as an artist, you're on some of the social media platforms and you're promoting yourselves. This is great because they're free, right? Like social media doesn't have to cost money. Uh, a lot of times it's, um, it's free or, or relatively uh, low priced. And um, 
as a result of that, you you can do it yourself. And I really encourage folks to hold off on hiring professionals to do your social media until you get to a point where you have so much content and so much good, you know, so many great photos and professional videos that you say, okay, now I need a professional to help me organize this. And you can contact Mac and, and, and there's people within this network who would be very good at helping you. But, um, you know, I, I like to try and be an example for social media. If you go on my social media, which is Rohit Do Good, Rohit Do Good, it's, uh, it's all just mostly positive content. You know, I'm posting things about community, stuff that I find uh, interesting, things, things that um, a lot of times have something visual associated with it. So have a look at any of my platforms and you'll see, even on TikTok, I even joined TikTok last year and um, I started posting some artist videos um, on there because I, I thought, okay, you know, maybe, maybe if I put a little bit of content, but it's good quality, it'll put out the kind of messaging that, that I'm trying to promote. Um, so have a look at that as an example. And I hope that helps. I'm going to dive into this um, uh, next section and then, and then I can go back and talk about uh, a, a budget. And I have an example that I pulled up with um, a little bit of information on that. Actually, I'm probably not going to get to it. Let me just do it now. Uh, so here's an example of a budget, okay? And you should be seeing a PDF on your screen. And and what I've done here is I've included some very specific uh, information. So under artistic expenses, right? It says over here, this person will earn this much money for Im image generation and curation, concert fees, workshop fees, rehearsals. This person will earn this much money for music composition and music performance. Now it's it's giving broad amounts. I think those amounts could have been broken down a little bit deeper, um, but this was just a draft. It's just something I found quickly on my computer. It was a draft in, in a process. And so at least instead of saying, you know, this dollar figure here, at least the fees were broken down, right? Into specific amounts. Over here, have a look at this. This is amazing. Fees and salaries of production or technical personnel. So it talks about very specifically who is being paid, how much are they being paid? Where? Okay. Rental space costs, tech equipment rentals. So the more detail you can provide, the better. I know this is a draft because I remember telling them that they needed to go into even more detail. Put down your hourly rates, you know, rental space costs. How much time is that being rented for? Live streaming. Um, can that be broken down in any way beyond the $1,100 it says here, right? Is it, is it, $100 an hour times 11 hours, or maybe it's $200 an hour times 5.5 hours. Um, this is the level of detail that you need in a budget. And, and you can see that multiple lines are filled in. They didn't just say, eh, production personnel, you know, uh, $5,600. No, they broke it down into technical staffing, rental, technical equipment, travel, live streaming. So I hope that answers the question about budgets. The bottom line is use the description box and give a lot of description. Even this isn't enough description. What I showed you up here, even this isn't enough. You need to break these rates down almost by hour or by day and then reference how did you come up with those rates. Okay, so great question. Thank you for that. I'm going to talk about different grant opportunities and we're going to go through a bunch. So my advice is instead of trying to scribble everything down, just grab the name. So in this case, it's Ontario Arts Council Music Production and Presentation Projects. You can just search OAC music production. It'll come up. Uh, and what I have here is a really short summary. There's quite a bit of information um, that'll appear on, on the funder's website. And so, uh, you know, my advice to you is um, have a look at, at these things on, 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 you know, do a Google search, have a look at them on Google, go and read uh, in explicit detail what each grant is about, but you can get a bit of an overview today um, just from this presentation. Okay, so uh, the next one is due March 28th. This uh, funding opportunity has a ton of different categories in it. You could apply as an individual for 20K. You could apply as a group, uh, training group, et cetera, et cetera. They fund individual artists, most importantly. And that's what I really focused on when I did my search here for these opportunities. Um, you could apply to up to 20K for music production and presentation, but there's a ton of stipulations. Right. So it sounds easy. It sounds all great. This grant's going to take you like 20 hours of work if you want to apply for it properly. And you need attachments. You need, um, you know, past examples of work that you've produced. Um, 
you also need to, of course, have a profile. It has to be uh, a strong profile where you filled in all the fields. There's a lot going on here, but I, I just want to provide you with some information at first, and then you take it from there. Another uh, opportunity for, for musicians, music creation projects, okay? So this one is, is, is for um, really anyone who's, who's creating, maybe you're creating for the first time, or maybe you're commissioning work. Maybe, maybe you have a little bit more experience. Uh, you're songwriting, you're enhancing music, right? Uh, mixing and mastering. Um, you can even be doing community work here, which is really unique. Uh, so organizations are eligible, individuals are eligible. This one closes on April 13th. This is good, especially for someone who's creating for the first time. Um, you know, read through it in, in, in depth and make sure you understand what OAC is looking for. And of course, reach out to the grant officer. You know, sometimes I say you can be a little shy and say, hey, it's my first time applying. Do you have any tips? Or even be bold and say, hey, you know, I, I answered uh, a certain question like this. What do you think? Do you have any advice? You never know. They they may help you out a lot. Sometimes it depends on who, who you're connected to. They can't favoritize you and like you know, hold your hand and help you with the entire grant, but they can help you with parts of it. And maybe a secret I'll tell you is that they can help you more on the phone than they can in writing. In writing, everything is documented, you know, so so they don't want to show favoritism. But on the phone, they could actually be looking at your answer and say, well, you know what? Over here, you talked about uh, um, you know your past experience managing budgets, but you didn't list how much money uh, you managed, or you didn't list when or where. You know they'll give you advice like that, really detailed advice, if you request a phone call. Um, I, I believe, at least that's been my experience. So, so have a look at grants like like the OAC Music Creation Projects. Here's another one. This one closes in May. Um, so this is music recording projects. Uh, so it's pretty self-explanatory. Now, note the stipulations. If your songs are under 25 minutes, you can apply for 4K in the demo slash EP category. If your songs are, it could be a single song or it could be songs uh, are over 25 minutes, then you can apply for full length album. So I remember we were working on this grant and you know there were six songs in the album and, and, and it was like, okay, I gotta go add up all the minutes here. Does it add up to 25 minutes or not? And I remember the artist decided to add another song. So we went past the 25 minute threshold so they could apply for um, under 10, under 10,000, um, you know, so here's a great opportunity. Now, uh, interesting question, would hiring a professional grant writer be considered negative by the reviewer? So funny enough, we, we grapple with this question ourselves. And the solution we've come up with is that you'll never see our name on any grant application. You'll never see do good fundraising written there. So the, the funder won't see that you've worked with a grant writer. Would it be considered negative? I don't know. There, there's no reason why it would be considered negative to work with a grant writer. But I'll say that if you submit a grant and the funder sees that you're an artist and you've put in all the work to actually complete a grant application, because because they're a lot of work, you will earn respect from the funder. And if you get declined, but you do your due diligence and you follow up with the funder and you say, hey, you know, uh, it was my first time applying. I got declined. Could I get some feedback? You do that 10 minute call, they give you feedback, you write it down, you go back and you change your application and you apply the next year. Now you have more respect from that funder. You are way more likely to be successful on the grant if you demonstrate that you took the feedback from the funder and you incorporated it. And I'm speaking from direct experience here. When I was with the Ontario Trillium Foundation, when we used to give feedback on a grant, we would literally tell people exactly what they needed to fix they would come back and fix it and they would win the grant. I saw that again and again, and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. The very few people who took the time to reach out to us, when they actually listened to our advice and they went back and they revised the grant, they won next time. So I hope that uh, helps. And I think grant writers are great. Of course, I'm gonna say that I'm a grant writer. Um, you know, we can help you navigate complexity. We can help you uh, avoid pitfalls. We'll save you time. Um, so, so for me, I think it's great to work with a grant writer, but I don't think you're gonna you're gonna get declined, or I don't think you're gonna get poor marks if a funder ever found out you worked with one. I mean, the OAC actually offers application assistance if you if you need it. I believe um, 
I think it's for artists with disabilities that they, they have a certain program that offers this kind of assistance. They actually work with people like me uh, to give applicants who are disadvantaged like a, a step up or a leg up, uh, so to speak. And, um, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it's great. Um, and there's a question about, uh, can you ask for feedback on recommender grants? I'm not 100% familiar with how, how the recommender grant system works. Um, so I'm gonna say, I don't know that one, uh, but any grant that is funded by a government, you have the right to ask for feedback because that's your tax paying dollars. It's actually our money. OAC is, is, is mostly our money. Nobody's making charitable donations uh, as far as I know to the OAC. I think for the most part, it's government dollars which come from us. So don't ever feel shy about going back and asking for feedback because you're literally, uh, it's your right uh, to, to be able to ask for feedback on a grant. That is um, uh, the least they can do. And if you ever run into trouble, uh, you know, reach out to Mac and 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 maybe they might have um, a direct line to the funder because of the relationships they've built over the years. Uh, okay, let me just continue here. So another uh, music opportunity is Factor Juried Sound Recording. They usually close in mid-May. Um, so we, we, we've seen that uh, uh, every year they announce pretty much the same date, uh, but I just put mid-May and mid-November here just to be safe. Um, and we can provide uh, like a PDF with some of these notes to Susan. I'll, I'll provide this after the after the meeting if anybody needs it. Okay, so, so here, interestingly, 75% of the total budget will be funded. In other words, 25% of your budget will not be funded. Um, so there's a radio marketing component. This is big. We, we've applied for this one. And uh, essentially, they're giving you the opportunity to get on the radio as an artist and, and to promote yourselves, which is huge um, for, for musicians. And they'll give up to $10,000 for sound recording. So interestingly, OAC also funds sound recording. Factor also funds sound recording. Hmm. What if you were to submit the same application to both and hedge your bets? You can. Okay, you can actually submit the same application for the same sound recording project to both. The only trick to this is you can only say yes to one. It's not a trick. It's more, it's more the rule. The only rule is that you can only say yes to one. So in other words, if you submitted an application for $10,000 to the OAC and you won, and then a week later, Factor calls you back and says you won, you can't take the money from both. That's called double dipping. So, um, you know, this, this grant is a really good one because it contributes to a ton of costs that you have associated with an album. So those of us who are musicians on, on the call here um, on the webinar, you'll really want to apply for this factor grant. It's one of the biggest ones. And, and those who win it, it can actually be pretty monumental for your career. Okay, so we're wrapping up on the music opportunities here. We'll go into some other ones. Um, Toronto Arts Council. They do require residence in Toronto for at least a year. And uh, they have the creation category for $5,000. That's for writing and composition. They have the demo slash EP category for $4,000. Those are for like short recordings, short form recordings. You also saw this in the, in the OAC grant as well. Um, and then full length album, $10,000. Songwriter development, tiny grant, up to $2,000 um, for songwriting initiatives. Theater, let's talk about theater. Uh, there, was, there was a theater opportunity that closed and then another one opened. Um, so I think we're missing a dollar figure there. One of them is uh, support for new or emerging playwrights. That's $4,000 and then I believe that next bullet points should say support for mid-career or senior playwrights. I believe it's $10,000, if I'm not mistaken. Um, again, it's a Toronto Arts Council grant, so it requires a one-year residency in Toronto, and that closes in June. So you do have time to, um, uh, you do have time to look into this one uh, and just confirm the amounts there. Okay, another theater opportunity. This one just passed in February, but it opens again in August. And this is the case of most grants. They're cyclical. They keep coming and going again and again. So let's say it's too bad you didn't win in February. Then you just apply for August. And if you're really bright, you grab the feedback from the funder from the February grant, and then you apply it to the August grant. And you let them know. You email them saying, hey, thanks very much for the great conversation we had about 
the grant. I understand I made these mistakes. I'm going to reapply. And then in August, after you apply, you just send a note to say, hey, remember me? I applied. And um, I, I would love to hear that this strategy worked. You know, as long as you're writing strong grants, I would love to hear that that, that resulted in um, funding for, for some of the artists on the call today. So creation, they'll fund $5,000. Creation in residence, $10,000. Workshops related to theater, $15,000. Full productions, $20,000. If you're performing at a festival or an initiative or uh, sort of a fringe festival, $15,000. So a lot of groups can apply to this. This is a big one. This is probably one of the biggest theater grants that takes place. And um, yeah, it closes uh, in August next. So you have lots of time. Okay, let's talk visual arts. So, so some of these are ongoing, which is nice because it doesn't put that pressure on you to, to, to get the grant by a certain deadline. Um, so it's ongoing. Now look at level one and level two. Level one, you have to have between two and seven years of independent experience. Level two is over seven years of experience with national or international recognition. As a visual artist, what I've observed in the, in the um, not as a visual artist, uh, for visual artists, what I've observed within granting is that they look at your years of experience as some sort of badge. The more experience you have, the more money you can apply for. So as you get to the upper years of, of, of your professional arts experience, I think they're assuming that your art gets better. And so they're more likely to invest in you. Um, so $5,000 for level one, $10,000 for level two. Uh, interestingly, they, they wrote something here about the Toronto residents. They said, Temporary residences or absences for up to 12 months may be okay, which means let's say during COVID you were like stuck in Thailand or something. That's perfectly fine. You just have to let them know what happened, right? So I, I think that's a, that's a pretty good one. And that's uh, open until October 2nd. And there was some stipulation that after October 2nd, I believe something happens. Like you have to wait until November if you want to apply again. Like the month of October is closed, I think. Okay, this one actually has a firm date of May 3rd. So this is visual artists creation projects, visual artists creation projects. And this one takes a few minutes to understand. It's that thing I just mentioned about how many years of experience you have means, you know, what level can you apply for? So you have at least three years of public presentation experience and you have what's considered a small exhibition record, which means you haven't exhibited that much, but you have some exhibitions under your belt. $5,000. You have eight years of public experience, eight years presenting your art professionally as a visual artist, and you have a reasonable body of art or body of work. Uh, what's reasonable? You know, uh, It's open to interpretation, but they'll give you seven and a half thousand. And all of a sudden, if you have uh, 15 years of experience, um, extensive work, you know, they want national or international exhibitions, which is not unusual. If you have 15 years of experience, you probably should be at that level. Uh, they'll give you $15,000, right? So I think, and a lot of these figures are, are, I believe some of them are up to, I don't think it's exactly that dollar figure you can apply for up to. Um, but I think what's interesting here is that they do restrict you a little bit. So OAC has other grants, like a visual arts grants, a craft grant, a media arts program. You can actually only apply to one. This is tough because as an artist, you may feel that you want to apply to the craft program and to this one, you have to really choose. And, and again, I'm trying to provide you with some tips here. I, I think that when you're applying to a grant like this and you're making a tough choice, you should get on the phone and talk to OAC you should tell them that you need help making this decision because you don't want to apply here. And then later on, they tell you, ah, you know, you really shouldn't have applied to the media arts program. You don't want to hear that after you've spent like 20 hours working on this grant application. Now you're exhausted. You know, if you find out you got declined here, you may, you may not want to apply for more. Right. So it's better to do your homework in advance, chat with the program officers. They're there for you. I mean, this is their job. They're highly paid professionals who get to um, uh, coach and guide people on, on the streams. Every stream has a different professional assigned to it. OAC has a ton of people working for them. So um, I'm, I'm actually gonna say, don't, don't come to us 
as do good fundraising when it comes to knowing which one to apply for, go to OAC and ask them. Where you would come to us is maybe if you need, uh, I guess, a high degree of support with your with your writing, where you have a great project, you have a great idea, but you're just not very good at writing it, you're not sure how, um, reach out to Mac, let them know you need the help, they can, they can connect with us, and um, hopefully we can support. Okay. November 23rd, visual arts projects. So galleries can apply for up to 15K, groups can apply for up to 15K. You must have at least half your uh, group be in Ontario. So, so you know, obviously it's an Ontario taxpayer funded grant, so they don't want to fund like a group of artists from South America, for example. As long as half of your residents are from Ontario, you're good. And then interestingly, Independent curators who are presenting work can apply for 15,000. So I'm sure we have some independent curators here. Um, and those who are applying for research, 10,000, which is great. And I mean, some of you might be saying these amounts aren't that high, but um, you know, they're really trying to fund as many people as possible. And so I think that's, that's why they've kept the amounts fairly low. Uh, and they assume you're gonna get other funding from elsewhere. You'll have ticket fees in some cases. Um, you know, but uh, but uh, compared to the nonprofit and charitable sector, these rates are a little bit lower. They, I, I wish they were offering more funding than what they're giving. Media arts. This is a pretty big one. Um, look at the dollar figures here. This is due on April fourth. So emerging artists who've completed at least one independent media work can apply for up to ten thousand. Mid career artists who've completed at least two media works and have five years of professional experience and established artists with fifth, up to 15 years of professional experience, they can apply for $40,000. So this is a big one and you can see why. That's, you know, that's like a, a salary, right? Uh, and so if you're working on a project, it better be a really comprehensive project that's gonna take a long time uh, and it's, it's gonna be quite time consuming. You'll put together a detailed budget. You're not going to ask OEC to fund 100% of the budget because no funder wants to fund 100%. So maybe your project is a $50,000 project. Maybe it's a $100,000 project. And, and especially for mid-career and established artists, they'll pay $40,000, up to $40,000, which is a lot, I think. Um, and so you can imagine this category is highly competitive. Think about how many people across Ontario would be applying to this. And so um, probably a good idea to call them. now. This is media artists creation projects. You can't also apply to visual artists creation projects. They practically sound like the same thing. There's one word that's different, which is media versus visual. So OAC has like really strict definitions. I, I remember I was on a call with their program manager once. We were like trying to understand why the group that we worked with wasn't going to fit into their definition. And it was this sort of an issue. It was like media artists versus visual artists. And the artist was saying, well, I'm a media artist, but I also categorize myself as a visual artist. And, you know, we had some back and forth there, um, but we figured it out. And uh, I just want you to know that there's category exclusivity and restrictions. And uh, the, the best way to get this solved is to contact the, the program officer. And I would say put things in writing, right? Because it's one thing to have a phone conversation and, and you end the phone conversation thinking that you're applying to media artists. If you don't write them an email to say, hey, thanks for the call today, just want to confirm, you know, this is what we discussed. I'm going to apply to media artists. And then they reply saying, okay. If you don't do that later on, you can't come back to them and say, hey, um, you know, uh, I applied as a media artist and you guys said it was okay, right? You can't do that unless you actually have that in writing. And, um, you know, there are, there are instances where, um, you'll interact with the funder and they'll actually guide you in the right direction. Whereas you, you thought, and you thought for sure you were supposed to apply to one category, they'll guide you into another, um, you know, it could lead to a successful grant, right? So it's worth taking the time to reach out. Almost no one does it. I don't know why. I, I think there's a little bit of fear sometimes about reaching out to funders. They're just ordinary people, you know, any, anybody can apply for these jobs. So I think, um, you know, I think it's very important to use those resources, especially when it's so confusing, because it's taken me a while to understand OAC and like how to navigate all their 
20 or 30 different categories they have. Most of them sound the same. Um, and so if I'm a professional from this space and I'm telling you I find it confusing, trust me, uh, it's super confusing. Okay. Um, so here's media arts projects, right? Uh, April 27th is the deadline. So you can present, disseminate, document uh, the work of Ontario media artists. So there's the dollar figures there. $15,000 um, is a cap, you know, and, and the list goes on. There's more uh, in media arts. There's one for Toronto that's closing in mid-October. Uh, again, level one, you know, two to seven years of experience, $6,000. Level two, eight to 14 years of experience, $12,000. You would think that the funders would talk to each other and set the same levels, but they have their own levels for some reason. Um, dance projects, okay. So this is a bit different from what we've been talking about. This is one of the bigger um, categories for this grant. Um, you can develop a dance project, you can produce it, or you, you can present it. And I think um, what's neat here is that they fund creation. So for, for, for dance artists on the call today, uh, they support choreography, they support the development of new work at $5,000, which is nice. Uh, it's not a lot of money, but it's a start. They also support production and presentation. And what I've learned from working with a prominent dance group in Mississauga is um, these productions, they are very costly. Like just renting the studio space is costly, bringing in the dancers, making sure they're getting paid for rehearsals. And then, of course, the live performances. Um, you know, so so I think there's there's really two ways to go about grants. One is as an individual. You apply on your own. You put on your own productions and exhibitions and things. Another is to go in as a group. You know, and over here, you can see that series and festivals that promote choreographers and dance companies, they can apply for 15K, right? So sometimes as an artist, you can also make money uh, going through a group. And what happens is that group applies for the money and they pay you, right? So let's say you're a dancer, you can create your own work and apply. You can also be part of a bigger work and have that institution apply. Sometimes you can even reach out to the institution and say, hey, I'd love to present at your conference. I'd love to present at your event. There's actually a grant deadline coming up. It's due March 29th. Would you be interested? Right? So you end up creating your own your own business opportunities just by letting people know that these opportunities exist. Um, and of course, I'm going to say that if they don't want to write the grant, if they say yes to you, but they say they don't have time to write the grant, have somebody, you know, reach out to me through Mac and maybe we can help. So I'm pretty sure this grant closes around the same time. Dance projects. Uh, let me see. Oh, OK. I see what I've done here. So, so there are additional categories um, that are part of this. So there is mentorship, which means that individuals, um, especially Indigenous artists, um, those who identify as deaf artists, artists with disabilities, you can apply for two and a half thousand just to obtain mentorship support and training and community development, right? So let's say you're a professional dancer and you want to actually put on some workshops, but you want to get paid for those workshops. People are willing to have you come and do them for free, but you want to get paid. Um, they can actually, you can actually obtain funding to go out into the community and do this work to get paid. You wouldn't necessarily need to charge for this work because Ontario Arts Council would pay for it, but you would get paid for the time you spent putting together the workshop or the forum or the masterclass, the time you spend rehearsing and the actual time you spend delivering it live. Pretty interesting. Uh, Toronto Arts Council has one as well. You know, similar categories, but different dollar figures. You'll notice dance series and festivals is 10,000. There's a development grant, it's 8,000. Feel free to use the chat if questions are coming up and we're, we're wrapping up. I see it's uh, 8.15, so about 15 more minutes here. Craft projects. So uh, emerging artists and curators, $5,000. Mid-career artists, 7,500. Established artists, 15,000. You know, they have a connections category and a collaborations category. 
So if you're researching, you're creating, or you're developing within the crafts field, looks like they have one deadline for the year. Literary artists. I didn't put an exhaustive list here because there are quite a few grants out there. Some of them are a little bit smaller. So this is the big one. Um, creation, $5,000. Recording, $10,000. Creation and recording. Okay, so I'm, I'm not sure about the definition of that, but uh, you can apply for $15,000. These grants were weird in that it's all or nothing. So you can't apply for up to five, you apply for five. You can't apply for up to 10, you just apply for 10. Um, so, so you need a, uh, a professional history, right? So they've given some examples at the bottom of the slide there. Um, you, you need to provide uh, an example of the history that you have in this area. They want to make sure they're truly funding literary artists. Okay. Literary creation projects. So, so this is actually work that you create for a performance. If you're creating some sort of a work for publication, it's 12,000. And if you have a recent publishing history, um, you've published at least 48 pages or you have three traditionally published sort of short works, or you actually have a publishing company where you're, where you're self-publishing, you have some sort of a, uh, a professional practice, then you can apply for this grant, okay? So there's, there's a lot of stipulations in each arts uh, grant. This is what I find. Every single one of them is niche. They're all different. Usually it's like different dollar amounts, different wording. It, it's kind of confusing. But uh, a lot of this information I gathered by doing searches. I spent hours searching online for all this and made sure it was all uh, accurate and updated. Deaf and disability arts projects, October 12th, creation. $10,000. That's for research and development. Production, um, $10,000. Professional development, $10,000. And so, and so you really have to have that disability. You must uh, have been diagnosed with it, or you, you must have some sort of, you know, proof, you know, don't just say that you have a disability, make sure that it's, it's, it's uh, uh, something that you identify with and, and, and that you can justify it somehow. I'm not sure how how that is qualified, but I think um, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities within OAC, which is why I focused the presentation on it. Um, there's really a grant for for everyone of every background, all abilities, all disciplines. Here's a Toronto Arts Council grant called Black Arts Projects. Uh, that's actually ongoing, so there's no firm deadline, but you can apply until October 2nd, and then I think it stops at that point, and it probably continues uh, after October. Creation and development, 10K. Add in a mentorship component, and now it's 15K. Or if you're doing a presentation uh, as a Black artist, 15K, and if you add mentorship, so you get somebody to come and support you and help you, and you're going to pay that person, now you can ask for up to 20K. So again, Toronto residence is required. Um, this one's interesting. This is one of the most confusing ones. Multi and inter-arts projects. Sometimes it's hard to understand how OAC defines this. This was, this was one of the ones that you remember I spoke about an example where we're trying to figure out which grant fits uh, into one category or another. It was this one. I, it took me a long time just to understand what they even meant by multi and inter arts projects. Anyway, closes in, in late March. 10K for creation, 20K for production and presentation, 15K for series or festivals, and 8K if you're doing development work. But it has to to be in Ontario. Obviously, it's an Ontario government funded grant, right? Curatorial projects. Uh, this is really a focus on Indigenous uh, curators uh, at $30,000. And if you're, if you identify as a person of color, people of color, $30,000. So here they've stipulated that you can pay the curator up to 10, you can pay the mentor up to two, you can pay the publication expenses up to 5k, and your exhibition up to 10K. Um, so I think there's a few K missing over there, and that's probably for other, other expenses within the project. But you can't pay the curator 30K, right? So I wanna point out how many restrictions there are. It's just, there are a lot of restrictions and you can get declined because you missed one of these things. So please note. 
exhibitions. We did get asked uh, from time to time from artists, hey, we're putting on an exhibition, can you help us? Now this grant only provides up to $2,000. It's not a lot, but I thought to include it in here anyway. So it's for um, folks working in visual arts, craft and media arts. And you have to have a confirmed public exhibition. We ran into an issue with this because we were applying for this grant and then the artist didn't have the confirmed exhibition. And they were like, we can't confirm it until we know we have money. And I said, well, you can't know you have money until you've confirmed it. And so there's this weird thing in granting where funders somehow expect you to have all the details figured out. When in doubt, you should just go with what you know. Um, and if, if there's certain details you don't have figured out, you can still put them in a grant. I think it's okay because the funders expect every minute detail to be confirmed. You know, they want your exhibition to be confirmed even before you get the funding. So go for it. And um, if you can get a letter stating that, yep, you have been invited, you know, to Mexico, for example, to put on an exhibition, then uh, that letter would be attached to your application. Right. Um, so keep that in mind. And we're finally through that part. That was probably the heaviest part of the presentation, just too many opportunities. So we'll move to questions and discussions. Uh, and I wanna thank everyone for your time so far. I know it's uh, Tuesday night and people have lots to do. So thanks for spending the time with me and Ms. Saga Arts Council. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rohit. That was very informative. And I always love the grant rundown. I'm like, oh yeah, that one. Oh yeah, that one. So it's always a good reminder. Um, so I know we have addressed a lot of questions as they came up, but feel free to uh, to add some to the chat. And uh, if you want to turn your camera on and uh, or unmute and ask a question in person, you're welcome to do that. Um, okay. A fire hose of information. Yes, indeed, Catherine. <laughs> I think everyone might just be sitting stunned trying to take it all in. It's a lot of information. <laughs> yeah, and this is only a fraction of it, right? There's a lot more. So I'm, I'll do a shameless self-promotion for Mac here. We actually have our own microgrant program. Um, again, the you know, small fees, we we funded ourselves through fundraising efforts, including our gala in the fall. And um, we just opened them up last week. They're, um, all of our applications are due on April 3rd. Um, you have to be a resident of Mississauga to apply, but we have seven different funding streams across all artistic disciplines. So we have a theater in the park, a music showcase, um, event production, micro grant, a community activation micro grant, which is new and I'm pretty excited about it. I think we can get some really neat applications and um, I always just love seeing the interesting projects coming up. Oh, thanks Rohit. <laughs> um, what else do we have? A visual artist exhibition um, and our most popular are matchmakers, which are very flexible and cover uh, pretty much anything. So um, definitely check it out. I will I will put the link in the chat for everyone so you can check out our micro grants. We have an information session. So when Rohit was saying, you know, go to the information sessions, reach out to the program officer. I'm the program officer and I'll be running an info session next week. So you're welcome to join us on Zoom for that. And again, we'll be recording that info session and adding it to our website here. So there we go. A list of the grants mentioned is going to be available on Mac site. Uh, Rohit, would you be willing, or this was in your, I think you shared your presentation with me that I can add to our- Yeah, website. yeah, I'll, I'll just send you an update after this call and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, we can send that out to everyone, sure. Perfect, and this, we have recorded this, so we'll uh, we'll do a quick edit and we'll get it up on our YouTube page and I'll get that mailed off, emailed off to everyone. So have a look for an email from, from probably from my address, but coming through MailChimp. So double check promotions folders if you haven't seen something by the end of the week. Um, Rohit, here's a question for you. Uh, can you give us an example of rates that do good would charge for consultation and writing? Ah, so I was I was going to suggest to just email us at info at dogoodfundraising.ca. We really take on certain grants on a grant by grant basis. It's dependent on how much capacity we have at that time, how busy we are. We, we don't want to disappoint anyone. So, 
So generally, we take on the grants 15 days before the deadline, which means that 15 days before the deadline, we are often working on something else. Um, yeah, so so rates are always changing. And I mean, you know, just send us an email. What I would like you to actually do is to go through Mac. So, so these sessions are only helpful if you as a member are finding value in it. And Ms. Sog Arts Council won't know if you're finding value unless you say to them, hey, we're finding value. Can you connect us to do good fundraising, for example, or another fundraising professional? Um, and so and so that would be the channel I'd love for you to use because Mac is a nonprofit uh, that's mission is to help artists. And so they'll know they're helping you if you contact them. Uh, yeah, here, I'll throw my email in the chat so everyone can can grab it if they need it. Um, and we're pretty quick at turning around and introducing people or getting you information you need. So do you feel free to reach out anytime? Wonderful. Well, this was great. I thought there were some great questions asked. Uh, so I really Absolutely. appreciate that. Great. All right. Well, if everyone is questioned out, don't worry. If you think of something later, you can always reach out to Rohit or myself. My email's in the chat for you. Um, thank you so much for, for taking a, a slightly snowy Tuesday or not snowy anymore. I don't know, a winter Tuesday and joining us. Um, and our TD Culture Lab, this is the second webinar in our series. Last week, we taught people how to use green screens and light them. So those resources are now on our website. Um, and next week, we're going to be having a conversation about public art um, from some public art, um, some people who commission projects as well as artists who are involved. Um, so I think it's going to be a really fun chat. Um, and then also in March, we have a session on podcasting and then one for mu the musicians in the house on copyright and streaming rights. Um, so if you're interested in any of those topics, please feel free to check them out. Again, tickets are all through Eventbrite and they are free, which is great. Um, so thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much, Rohit. This was wonderful. We always appreciate your great tips and it gets it gets our uh, our creative writing juices flowing. So thank you so much. And uh, thanks to everyone who joined us tonight.